Hello everyone and welcome to our Gem Pursuit. My name is Matthew Weldon and I'm joined in our magical and mysterious pursuit to the world of antique and vintage jewellery by my trusty co-host Elise Ketcher. Hello Elise. Hi everybody. We're just over halfway through our short series Royal Regalia, A History of Splendour, looking at the stories and histories behind some of the world's most famous crown jewels. In the last two episodes, we delved into some brilliant stories from Denmark and Iran, which are on your podcast app right now. Today, we continue with one of the oldest crown jewel collections in the world. We'll find out just how surprisingly old they actually are, how they were once lost and found again, and the controversies that surround them to this very day, including why a man will never be able to wear a 105 carat Kohinoor diamond. Elise, do reveal who we're going to talk about today. It's going to be the British Royal Regalia today, so it's going to be a long one, Matthew. Well, let's get started then. So, the British Royal Regalia, at least the crown jewels of England. Let's talk a little bit about just the history of how they got to where they are today, because it This one does go back quite a long way. It does. I mean, I think we we forget a lot about our history when when we think about royal families because we just associate it with who is the figure person that we're seeing right now on our TV screens, in our media, and we forget like the long legacy of the family and how they got there. And usually it's quite bloody. Um, and, uh, there's lots of skeletons in closets and dungeons that, you know, that a lot of people want to forget about, but they're there written in the history books. So really, um, Britain or Britannia as, uh, as it was known, kind of was established with different parts of it belonging to different people. And it wasn't until 771 AD that uh, the Saxon prince Egbert III, his birth kind of brings all of these different kingdoms together and he becomes the first kind of ruler of Britain. And it's from there that all of the current lineage kind of traces back to. But the problem is, is that it's like there's been abdications, the younger brother's taken over. Um, there's been like- the Abolition. There's been like three brothers and, you know, the first brother's died, the second brother's died, the third brother then takes over. And it's like for war. So it's like there's, it does follow family links, sometimes quite distantly. Um, nieces take over, for instance, Queen Victoria. So we have a family lineage tracing back to this, but very loosely, I would say, up until about King Henry VIII. Yeah. And then it's the, it's, you know, how the jewels and the royal regalia actually trace through it you know it mirrors in a way the lineage of the people but the thing about the jewels as we will discover as we talk about some of the interesting stories they don't always follow the exact path that you would expect um but i think the medieval period is a key one for the crown jewels of england Yeah, I mean, we go to, um, we have the kind of coronation of 828. And from there, that particular coronation, that's really known as the first English king, which again, which was a King Egbert. And the kind of regalia from there continues on to about 1660. This is when King Charles is beheaded. King Charles I is beheaded. And then the, you know, Cromwell takes over and it's not good for anybody. 
including the Irish. What happens there is he is searching for all of the jewels of the kingdom, including the royal regalia, to have it all dismantled and and broken and sold and taken away. And so a lot of it was the original regalia was taken away and and lost, as you said. And then in 1660, it was King Charles II, he is then restored after the protectorate. And then the regalia is then, some of it is recovered again, and then it starts up again from 1660. So the kind of regalia that we see today is more of what we actually understand and know of the British royal crown jewels today that we know today. And then just it, looking at that timeline there, it begs the question that, you know, between the execution of Charles I in 1649 and the restoration of the monarchy in 1660, that's 11 years, if my maths is correct. But where would the old regalia be if that hadn't have happened? Absolutely. Because so even though that's a quite, in terms of jewellery, that's still 300 and 60 years ago, that, that's, you know, extremely old jewelry. And a lot of the pieces before that are really ecclesiastical, mainly are, you know, ceremonial. But but it just, it, it leaves in my mind, it just it would have been so interesting for such a short period of time. It, it set the, the crown jewels back quite a lot. But uh, they, came, they came back with, with impressionate pieces though. Yeah. Yes. We have a lot to thank for the marriages that came into the British royal family. Um, I mean, a lot of the marriages brought extremely wealthy women into the kingdom who brought their own jewels that were bequeathed to them from other royal families. Queen Charlotte uh, brought in jewellery from her family. And of course, Queen Victoria had a wonderful collection of jewellery that she inherited from her mother, which had a lot of amethysts in it, which the queen still wore, the queen that just passed away, Queen Elizabeth II, still wore. And then we also have like, because they are connected to other royal families, we have royal families kind of fighting over jewellery. So we had Queen Victoria and King Ernest of Hanover who were fighting over Queen Charlotte's jewellery. Um, and that went on for decades until Queen Victoria was actually forced to give the jewellery back. So like, you know, it's, it's a normal family. We've still got family that are to this day, we know people that fight over land, that fight over money that their families have, have left behind. The Royal families are no different. And especially when diamonds come into the equation. Um, but I think that that even just, you know, in the shop, you know, what we'd see, like you always hear stories of Andy, whatever, when she passed away, she had this ring and no one's seen the yeah, ring and it it's still in the family it's still in the family right but someone obviously obviously has it but the difference is that i suppose with the royal jewels is that they're obviously just much more usually much more important pieces yes but really from queen victoria onwards what we're looking at is women really driving the force of the royal jewelry collection i mean we have from queen victoria we have uh, queen alexandra then from queen alexandra we have queen mary then we have queen elizabeth the queen mother then we have queen elizabeth the second and these women really really are the ones who drove the jewelry that we see today. And my gosh, it, it is an amazing, wondrous sight to see. Collection overview. Yeah, this well, is going to be how, so how long. Trying to, <laughs> trying to get an overview of this collection. It's so vast, but I think there is three main categories of it, right? So well, we've, we've talked about those categories. Yeah, definitely. But I'll let you, but two categories, but you go tell me the third. Well, there's, there's the crown jewels, of course, which yes. is really you're talking about ceremonial pieces used for the coronation. What everyone thinks of when they think of the British crown jewels is, is these pieces. Mm -hmm. 
So they're the first one. You've also got pieces in the Royal Collection. It's a bit like the Danish uh, Royal Family. They have, they have the crown jewels and they've also got this separate Royal Collection. Uh, and then similar again to the Danish Family, there's also then the personal collections, which are, you know, when I think of my mind, they're really just the person's jewellery. They don't even, because if they left the royal family, it would probably leave with them. So it's the royal jewels in the sense that the people are royal members, are members of the royal family, but it's just their jewellery. But I suppose because of their lineage and stuff, some of them are pretty impressive pieces. Yes. And just to give people a little bit of a um, understanding, like how does it become a state piece and how does it become a personal piece and how does it become royal regalia? So as a general rule, any gifts that are gifted to the sovereign from another monarch or a head of state automatically become part of the royal collection. So for instance, the queen goes over or now King Charles goes over to Australia and the say that the prime minister of Australia gifts a wattle brooch that's made out of gold and yellow sapphires. This would automatically become part, as a general rule, um, a part of the royal collection. But there is this rule is very loose. So due to this rule, there is currently 11 pieces of jewellery which are not housed in with the National Trust where all of the other jewellery pieces are, but are with the royal family. And people are like they're kind of contesting that they're actually part of the Royal collection and shouldn't be kept with the personal collections of the Royal family. So it's really kind of tricky to even, even, you know, the Royals don't really know, know when to draw the line when it comes to jewelry pieces. But when it comes to the Royal regalia, I want to go really quickly over the pieces that basically are used for the coronation or are used for the opening of the state parliament, which are pieces that are really super important to the national pride and history of the United Kingdom. Now, these include the King George IV state diadem. This particular diadem is completely circular with four cross pate, which are represent St. George. And then there's four bouquets with motifs of shamrocks, roses, and thistles, which represent the United Kingdom, which includes Ireland in their mind. And then set with diamonds and two bands of natural pearls. And this particular crown is probably the most viewed and seen crown around the world because it it has been worn by Queen Victoria for every single stamp that her portrait's been on. And it was also featured on the very first stamp that was ever issued that had Queen Victoria's head on it. So it is probably one of the most recognisable pieces from the crown jewels. Would I be correct in saying, I don't think that King George actually wore this for his coronation. It he was didn't. too it was too cuz it's it's pretty, isn't it? Like it it's, is. He commissioned it. He commissioned it. He did designed it of sorts and um he was advised 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 against it and he was like no 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 he was being very defiant. He wanted to wear it, but then when push came to shove and it was the day he didn't wear it. So it's only actually ever been worn by the women rulers of the United Kingdom. But if you if you look at it to me anyway, it does look it's well worth looking this up and we'll put a link in the show notes uh, so you can see it, but it does look to me to be quite feminine and probably the pearls at the bottom there's what you've got you've got the as Elise said the Maltese crosses. Yeah, they're called they're called a uh, cross patty. Because they're, they're not quite Maltese crosses because they're like a square, but then they've got cutouts. Yes. So have a look. You'll see it does look like a kind of motif that's similar to a Maltese cross. Yes. But they, I think, would be fine. And then you've got the, the symbols for Ireland and England and Scotland. 
but I, I for me, I I just think it's the pearls at the bottom that make they it. They were added later. Ah, yeah. So, but they even without that, it is quite a feminine piece, um, and I think that's why he perhaps looked at himself in the mirror with it on and didn't think I look so grand. He probably <laughs> thought I look pretty. Yeah. Um, but I'll quickly go through the other pieces. We have the Imperial State Crown, which everybody knows. It's the one that you see, that you've just seen King Charles be crowned on the head. It houses the Black Princess Ruby and we've talked about it loads. So I'm not going to talk about it anymore. The scepter and the orb. The scepter holds the largest of the Cullinan diamonds and the largest cut diamond in the world. 530 carats that diamond is. So I I mean, this is impressive. Really, really impressive. And the weight of these things as well is just incredible. Then we've got Saint uh, Saint Edward's crown, um, which is an, another piece that can be worn. You know, you get to pick and choose with this regalia which ones you wear. Of course, you have arm mills and the coronation ring, and the arm mills are made of pure gold, and they and they weigh one hundred and twenty seven grams each. They kind of look like, you know, when like a genie has been like locked in the bottle, like in a lamp and he has like those arm cuffs on. That's what they look like. And they're made of solid, pure gold and the inside of them is velvet, but they're 127 grams each. I mean, just think of that. If you look at the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II, you'll see her wearing them and they just look like they're plain gold. They're plain polished gold, but they're like big, massive gold cuffs. I mean, I I would wear them. I would wear them. They're just stunning. And then the coronation ring, I'll quickly go over the coronation and then I'll leave you to the rest of it, Matthew. But the coronation ring was worn for 45 years by Queen Elizabeth I. So she, it's kind of like when you put on the coronation ring ceremoniously, it's like you're getting married to the people. When you take your vows as a monarch, that you will protect them, that you will protect the kingdom with dignity and vigor. And when you put this ring on, it's like you're promising yourself as a service to the people. Um, And we know the Virgin Queen uh, Queen Victoria the first, she actually took that to heart, put the ring on her finger and never removed it for the 45 years that she was on the throne. And they actually had to saw it off when she was on her deathbed to have it taken to King James. But she, till her very last breath, she kind of kept it under wraps who she'd give the kingdom to. And then the ring was actually taken to King James from her deathbed to him to say, you are now the King of England. So like there's so much history behind these pieces. But you can see, the great thing is, as you said, you can see them in the coronations. And in King Charles, I distinctly remember the 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 ring that yeah the, it's huge but the beauty of his one is with modern cameras you can really see the detail yeah of this piece I would uh, love to I mean see the ceremony it. was beautiful you know it was it was really I mean it's lush no and one does pomp really like the English royal family like so exactly I mean this is this is what it's all about I have to say and I I don't if you disagree with me please message into us and let us know you know how to get in contact with us Instagram DM me or email us or go to our website and and send through a little message but for me I was really really upset with this last coronation of King Charles I mean where were the tiaras. I was just, where were they? No, it's not okay to not have the tiaras. Where were they? The moment when he he's crowned and then you expect all of the people in the audience to put on their tiaras or, you know, yeah, that, that was missing. Uh, it was, I think it was great though, but that was the one. I think on. they were scared of the, uh, of the being ostentatious of- and showing <laughs> off this kind of exuberant amount of wealth. Do they not know that we already know they have it? Like it's there. If it's sitting in a safe somewhere, at least let us see it. 
on somebody's head. I mean, please. No, that that is why. I'm sure that's why. But that's the point. It's like the we whole know. point of the ceremony is to be over the top. And, yes. yes. And so. we know, like, we know that those these things are in their safes. They're not just sitting around, like they're not in museums. They're actually in personal safes. Put them on and let us see them, please. Other little things that we have that also belong <laughs> to the British the royal things. family yeah. is, well, I wouldn't say it's little things, but I, I kind of find it a little bit upsetting having oh. come from a colonised country myself. Um the Scottish regalia is also a part of the British royal family. This is, you know, the Scottish crown, the scepter and the sword that represent royal power and justice. And, you know, it's a little bit controversial, but it's like, does it really belong to the British royal family? Yeah, but I think if you open that, can of worms. I don't know how far <laughs> down that would go. I mean, uh, but it, it technically does belong to the reigning monarch, but there is a silver lining, people. There is a silver lining. It's not allowed to leave Scotland. Yeah, well, that's that's good and very like the Iranian jewels as well. Yes, know, so it's leave. not allowed to leave Scotland, which for me was a silver lining. I mean, it belongs to the Scottish people and their reigning monarch and King Charles is their reigning monarch, but it does not leave Scotland. So I, I am very, very happy about that. And then the other pieces, which are small and sentimental pieces from the Royal Collections would be well, not from the royal collections, from the royal regalia, is the royal family orders, which is a tradition of the royal family. They receive a personal gift from the sovereign and it used to be a cameo of the person, but now it's like a painted ivory. It's a painted portrait on ivory that's surrounded by diamonds. And you might have seen it when they're wearing like these sashes and then they have like a little ribbon and then it has like a little portraiture kind of hanging on it. Those are little um, miniatures that are given as gifts and they're called Royal Family Orders. And it's a huge thing to have one. So like Princess Diana got one when she married Prince Charles and she got it a year afterwards and it was seen pinned to a ball gown. You don't know when they get it. They don't announce that somebody's got it. They just appear when they go to a state function or when they're wearing an evening gown and then you'll see the royal order pinned to them. It's really kind of like a sweet kind of open locket to show everybody that you're a part of the royal family, I would say. I mean, some of the pieces we've talked about are the ones that you're going to see a lot to stand out, but there's those pieces that are in a way might even be more important to the people who get them because it's specific to them, you know? So, but um, also, you know, as part of the crown jewels, you've got the famous Koh-i-Noor diamond we've talked about before. Season two, episode one, we talk about diamonds and the Koh-i-Noor is mentioned in detail uh, in that particular episode. It is 105 carats. So, uh, I would definitely recommend having a, lis- a listen to that. It is said that it's bad luck for any man to wear that diamond. All the men who've wore this diamond seem to have a very bad luck. Unfortunate <laughs> circumstances seem to to hit them. So it is worn by the ladies and is currently in the Queen Consort's crown. I mean, they're, they're all part of the crown jewels, right? So. Yeah, that's the royal regalia. So that's like the coronation jewels or jewellery that's worn specifically to open up state or parliament. Uh, yeah, so section section one. That's and yeah, literally we've section actually one. actually probably left out some key pieces there as well. But, you know. Uh, we've got, we got, most, got most of, of them. We got most of them. But like one thing that there is as well is like what, what I said in the beginning is that if you receive a gift from a, another sovereign or monarch or a head of state, that automatically goes to the royal collection. So the royal collection is actually enormous, Immense. Yeah. enormous. And we can't go over that today. Like this would be a whole episode 
on like sections. You could even do a whole episode on just brooches that have been gifted to the royal family over the years at every single uh, state engagement that they've had. It was it was customary. We could do it. Yeah, we could actually do a whole series just on the royal collection, just on really. brooches. Like there, it was customary for the royal family to receive a gift when they opened, like a factory or if they went to like the Royal Air Force and like, you know, w- there was a maiden voyage of a, of a plane or an opening of an airport, they would receive gifts that would automatically be either personal gifts, sometimes state gifts. And we do not have enough time to go through all of those gifts that they've received. But Let me just say when the the queen died, when the queen passed away, her personal collection, her private collection, these are things that we've seen her wear. So we don't know. She might have other stuff that she wasn't seen wearing, but over her reign, she was seen to have personally 14 tiaras, 34 pairs of earrings, 98 brooches, 46 necklaces, 37 bracelets, five pendants, 14 watches and 15 rings. That's a lot. That's, I mean, the number that stuck out there to me is the brooches. Like that's, uh, she had, she really wore them well, I think. And it's probably responsible for their popularity uh, in a lot of ways. But, and funny thinking of what we said, like, you know, the Koh-i-Noor diamond is controversial. Uh, the Scottish regalia controversial. I would say you're absolutely right. I would say there is pieces that we don't see because it actually would just be too controversial. Yeah. So, and, th- and that's the, the three parts of the collection, immense diversity and beautiful pieces in it. One day I certainly hope to see them. Still to come, we'll share our favourite crown jewels, including a brooch worn by no less than five queens. But first, we have some very beautiful pieces of ours on Instagram. Elise, can you tell me about one of these special pieces? As we are talking about queens and brooches, I thought I would share a wonderful piece that we currently have on Instagram, which is a clip brooch. Um, there can there is quite a few of these that can be found in the royal family with different gemstones. But the one that we're highlighting today is an Art Deco brooch, which is can be worn as either one piece with two swirling ends and scrolled diamonds to the terminals that can also come apart and be worn as two clips. And this piece is something, if you're looking to be quite regal yourself, a piece like this is exactly what you need in your wardrobe. So remember, if you would like to see these or any of the pieces that we talk about today, you will find more information in the description area of this podcast with links to follow, of course. So there are also hundreds of great photos of our very best pieces on Instagram, and you will find us there at Court Phil Antiques. great thing is though with section three we pick our favorite piece here right (laughs) in uh out of the collections of the british royal family at least what is your favorite piece of the british royal regalia well i didn't choose regalia well it kind of probably anyway you know these these things are difficult to categorize even they don't know how to categorize them sometimes my favorite piece was actually a piece that has ties to queen mary now queen mary is an absolute queen like more than you'd ever imagine this this woman was everything that you would expect a ruler 
to be when it comes to visuals. Always had a crown on her head or a tiara or an agri, like it's very difficult for me to explain. So I'm going to put some links to pictures and show notes so that you can see most of the time she had about, she either had a diamond encrusted, what they called a dog collar back then, which was a very, very thick collar of diamonds. Um, sometimes she wore eight rivieres of diamond necklaces all together at <laughs> once, which would then include a stomacher that had diamonds on it. Now a stomacher is usually like a three piece jewel that hangs from the bodice and dripping in diamonds. She would wear these cuffs of diamonds, all old mine cut diamonds that were again, part of uh, Queen Victoria's collection, but she would wear these on the daily right? She would, she understood the assignment and the assignment was wherever she went, she should look royal. She should act royal and she should put on a spectacle spectacle for the people because this is what they expected. And she was more than willing to fit that profile for them. Now, when she wanted a piece of jewelry created, it was, usually used with stones that were, had historical importance. It was never something that was kind of new. She wanted older stones. Now, I understand that because I'm pretty much exactly the same. I love older stones. And when she was going to be Queen the Empress of India, she wanted something quite special to wear to that particular um, engagement. And so it's very difficult to explain where the stones from this particular um, necklace come from. Now, it was originally a parure, um, but it's mostly seen today as just worn as a negligee necklace. And it's, of course, the Delhi Darba necklace or negligee necklace, which was part of the Delhi Daba Perur, which also had the Cambridge Emeralds and one of the Cullinan diamonds in it. Okay. Cause the Cullinan diamond was cleaved into many different diamonds, yes. all of which were basically used by the Royal family. Now this particular necklace were, is a favorite that is still worn today. Well, was worn by Queen Queen Elizabeth II. And it's like, if I could choose any piece from their royal collection to have as my own, it would be this necklace. It is stunning. So the Cambridge Emeralds, where, where did they come from? Well, the optics of where these emeralds came from is shrouded in mystery. And I think it's shrouded in mystery because they apparently came from a fa family collection through a marriage, through Mary's marriage. But I don't think they wanted people it to be public that they were actually were. So they never confirmed that they did come from the Cambridge Emeralds. So they say that everybody believes that they are the Cambridge Emeralds, but they've never actually admitted that they are the Cambridge Emeralds. I mean, because the Cambridge Emeralds have a very interesting history. history. Yes. So the, the thing is, is like, being royal as well is all about optics and you don't want things to be seen as the wrong kind of representation of what you're trying to do, especially since this particular parure is created for her to wear, to be crowned as empress in another country. So it's never actually been, you know, admitted to, but we believe it's the Cambridge Emeralds. Now, this is really a one of a kind necklace. So we're going to put links into it again because it's really hard to kind of explain it, but I'm going to do my best. So the emeralds who are, which are supposedly from her own family, which were supposedly won in a lottery 
in Germany by her grandmother, um, Pr- Princess Augusta. I love I loved that. The story. Duchess of like, Cambridge. Like it's like what type of a lottery? It it actually it was apparently a state sponsored charity lottery in Frankfurt. <laughs> and it was a small box and had about 40 cabochon emeralds in it. Yeah. I mean, so it has the, to be the charity lottery, lotteries I've gone to haven't had <laughs> these type of things in the prizes, like, like a signed jersey from which, my local team or we're something. Just, we're just not going to the right lotteries, Matthew. What are you talking about? We're just not going to the right well, lotteries. If you're not in, you can't win, I suppose. But, <laughs> but yes, so one apparently won there. But then they were kind of passed down to the Prince Francis of Tech. And then when he died, he left them to his mistress. And I mean, it goes on and on and on. I think that's why it's kind of like, it's a bit icky yeah, to but, be connected with them. But what I love about that is, so you take away the, the titles. A son inherited these emeralds and left them to his, well, he was unmarried. So it was girlfriend right <laughs> he, was, he was a girlfriend a mistress sounds so salacious right oh, yeah. but, okay but i'm just you just think so it's a son and then he dies and then his mistress in inverted commas has these emeralds and what happens is basically his sister is like whoa no way they are not hers but you can see how even though like Yes, they're rightfully the sisters, whatever. It's still icky to be, yes, so. to have it kind of connected to you. So, yes, they are those emeralds, right? We believe that they are those emeralds because they're cabochon cut as well and they're still in the cabochon form. And they're just the way that they are set together. I mean, oh, it's beautiful, it's stunning. It's so beautiful. So the piece ha- is kind of like a modern necklace um, with these eight Cambridge emeralds kind of around as centerpieces. And then you've got diamond necklaces or diamond strands that connect each of those emerald pendants. And then to add to the splendor, the emerald pendants have diamonds surrounding them. And then to the center, it has what we call a negligee pendant. Now, a negligee is actually two pendants, two separate pendant sections, one that is longer than the other. And in this one, you've got suspended on one side, you've got another Cambridge emerald. And then on the other, you have a marquee 8.8 carat diamond, which is the Cullinan the seven. So this particular necklace is royal. It is so, so royal. I mean, the Queen Elizabeth II, she wore this necklace when she was showing up. You know, she wanted to show up. She was going to wear this necklace. And I can imagine like when you wear something like this, you would feel otherworldly. It is just a magnificent piece and the matching of the emeralds. I mean, put me in that lottery. Cause uh, like I, if I could t- time travel and win those emeralds, like heaven, heaven. And there's, there's really great pictures of it on, on lots of different Queens. Yeah. It's and and it was made, yeah, okay. made by Garrard's the Royal jeweler in 1911, we believe. So this particular construction again is from the Edwardian period, right where you want it to be. Magnificent. All right. Top it, Matthew. Let's hear what yours is. Well, I don't think I'll be able to top that now. I don't know if any piece of jewelry would top that, but there's comparative pieces, at least. <laughs> it's interesting. That's the one you'd wear now. If you could get any yes, piece, that would be the one. Definitely. Yeah. And I'd just wear that, nothing else. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> well, what I'm going to go for is something, I mean, it's something that I think is a really interesting piece because When I think of the British royal family, I think of tiaras and brooches. That's what I actually think of. Now, there's obviously every other piece of jewellery, but they're the two that I I always think of Queen Elizabeth with a really stylish brooch on. 
that's actually what I think yeah. of. I mean, the Cullen and the granny chips. I mean, we can't even go over that today because <laughs> uh, honestly, chip. but the, they call it granny's chips, right? And it's the Cullen and uh, three and four, which yes. are like together. I mean, like what kind of granny chip is yeah, that? Please, not, granny, be my granny n- chip. 94.4 carats and 63.6 carats. That's a brooch uh, that is uh, basically two big, massive diamonds. Massive, uh, massive, like humongous. Yeah. But what the one I've actually want to talk about is one that I, I think is really interesting because it is... It is related to a wedding, so it, it it is fundamental to one of the traditions that we have today, and it's the Albert brooch, which also inspired quite a lot of other jewellery, actually. So on the eve of her wedding, Queen uh, Victoria's Queen wedding, Vi- Queen Victoria's, uh, one day before her wedding, which is 1840, uh, she was gifted a brooch by Albert, which was a very large sapphire uh, with Diamond surrounded, and she loved this brooch. And uh, now I've lo- you've looked it up. I actually couldn't find anywhere what type of sapphire it was. But have to have been Burmese or Kashmir. Had to have been. I don't know. If you look up the photos of it, it looks salon. Now maybe it could just be my lack of research. But let me just double. Check. Let me see if Lisa's going to see if we can find out what it is. But I'd be interested. Judging by the photos, it looks salon to me. But I stand open to correction. So she got this brooch. She noted in her diary that this was a splendid brooch, a large sapphire set round with diamonds, which is really quite beautiful. So you can see straight away she was really enamored. And we all know that her marriage to Albert was a very happy marriage, which was not always the case at that time because, you know, married for titles and land, etc. So uh, she wore for her wedding, which of course, when you think of it, was the something blue. And Elise has a picture there in front of me. There's lots of photos of this brooch and lots of different monarchs wearing it. So uh, well worth looking at. It, it up. doesn't state the origin of the sapphire. But that photo there, it does look, it, look, it doesn't look... It looks like it could be Kashmir as well because really? it's got a little bit of milkiness to it. But the thing is, without actually viewing it in person, you wouldn't be able to tell. Well, if that's a Kashmir sapphire, that is probably one of those valuable and Kashmir. It, and it probably is because it's the time period for it. But like you were saying, like the love story between Queen Victoria and her consort, Prince Albert, I mean, it's... It's legendary, number one, Uh, and it produced so many, well, it produced most of the known kingdoms and royal families in Europe because they had so many children and most of them were married out to the different kingdoms that we see today, like you know, this, the Swedish Royal family is connected to Victoria, the Spanish, like they're all connected to, to Queen Victoria and her posterity. But she mourned like no monarch has ever mourned before for the the death of her husband. So much so that she had his clothes laid out for him for the rest of her life, even though he had passed away. So every morning his footman would come up and lay out his clothes, even though he was no longer alive. She's also known as wearing his portrait on her, somewhere on her body, wherever, every single day. And when the Duomo in um, Florence was refurbished, it was said that she rode her carriage past it, stopped and then held his portrait up to the Duomo to show him, you know, because she'd think that he'd want to see the oh, renovations. Nice. So she had this, you know, innate love for him for the rest of her life and mourned his the loss of his presence in her life for the rest of her life. So the jewellery that she had t- from him was extremely special and became part, again, of the royal collections. But you can imagine this, the wedding gift that she received oh. would have been priceless to her because of what it represented. Yeah, I mean, you can only imagine. 
But this was designated after that as an heirloom of the crown. And as you mentioned earlier, exactly who owns what is... This is a, like a little... I think f- they keep it vague for a reason, to be honest. Oh, it's whoever gets their hands on it, probably in the event of emergency. <laughs> but it's um, designated as an heirloom of the crown, which this means... So f- all it's designated for all of the... Qu- the subsequent queens and queen consorts and queen regents to wear. And you can actually see all of them wearing this brooch. And Queen Elizabeth wore it frequently. Always, seemed to always be wearing like a blue yeah. coat or blue dress with this to the striking races. large yeah. sapphire brooch. And if you look at photographs of this, you can see it. And I also think, you know, it kind of, I don't know if it was related to it, but it is similar in style to Diana's engagement ring. Yes. It, whether, you know, you know, which was considered a commoner's ring. I mean, we'd even mention that one of the most famous pieces of it. But but I think that brooch is really special. It was something blue for Queen Victoria's wedding from Prince Albert. And I think it is a very special piece. And to wrap it up because I think uh, this is going to be a marathon episode now but it's uh, it deserves it though this collection where you can see the pieces today well we're very lucky that the British royal family do like to wear a lot of them so the first place you'd look is probably the tabloids um, <laughs> but if you actually want to visit them uh, you can see them the Tower of London's Jewel House uh, has housed the crown jewels since the early 14th century, actually, and they yes. can still be seen today. There was a couple of attempts uh, to try and rob them. A famous one by a Colonel Thomas Blood in 1671, who basically befriended the jewel housekeeper and then attacked them and tried to take them. Uh, <laughs> he was actually pardoned for that, believe it or not. The reasons for that are unknown. But that's where you can see them. I've actually never been, believe it or not. Either have I. And I lived in London for eight years. So, I mean, Matthew's squinting that because he's like, what? When you see the lines, you'll understand. You'll understand. But the Royal Regalia is on show for sure. But I, what I'm most interested in is the the private collections and the Royal Trust. And I did quite a bit of research to find out, like, you know, you think about it when the queen goes to get dressed, like, and she can go to a jewel room, where is the jewel room and what does it look like? Well, I have some answers to that question. And it's only in a book that I found that was kind of made in 1989. So it's like before, it was before kind of big electrical kind of security was an issue. So today they keep it really under wraps. Like you'd never hear them talking about where the jewels are kept, but apparently there is a strong room in the bottom of Buckingham Palace, which houses most of them. It's like a, a basically a bomb, a bomb shelter, but it houses the jewels as well. And it's connected to the local police station, which is just above Buckingham right on the corner it, of, yeah. the, of Buckingham Palace. So that whenever the doors of the safe are opened or the stronghold room is opened, that they're notified. So, you know, one of the Queen's assistants would obviously, or the King now, King Charles, one of the assistants would let the police station know that it's going to be accessed and then they would go into the jewel room, but just imagine what's in it. That's not open to the public for obvious reasons, but just imagine Matthew, apparently some of them still have the original boxes like from Queen Alexandra when she, when she came over from Denmark has the original boxes with the notes that she's written on it on what is her pieces of jewelry. And then they also acquired um, quite a few pieces of the Russian Tsar Rina's jewelry. Um, so that is also a part of the Royal collections, which can be found there, but I just want to have a look at this. So yeah, I'd say it's immense. Yeah. I, as I said, I'd say the pieces that nobody knows about there, they're really exciting ones, but, um, but the ones that you can see, are equally oppressive.
I really hope you enjoyed hearing about the beautiful collection of the crown jewels from the United Kingdom. Our next episode will be a bit of a surprise to wrap up this short series on royal regalia. We'll be revealing the unique story of the crown jewels from very close to home here in Ireland. Join us for that on St. Patrick's weekend. And just as I say, if you did enjoy our podcast, please do click follow on your player so you get your episodes automatically downloaded. And better again, share this with a friend if they have an interest in jewellery or antiques. It really helps the podcast grow. And the more we grow, the better research we can do and the better guests and stories we can get. So on that, as always, thank you to my trusty co-host, Elise Ketcher. Thank you, Elise. Thanks, everyone. To our researcher based in Paris, Veronique Gauguin, and our podcast producer, DustPod.io. And thank you most of all to everybody listening. I really hope you enjoy it. Until the next time for me, Matthew Weldon, chat to you soon. <laughs>